Science has sent orbiters to Neptune, eradicated smallpox, and created a supercomputer that can do 60 trillion calculations per second. Science frees us from superstition and dogma and enables us to base our knowledge on evidence. Well, most of us. Previously, I've explored how organized faith and primitive religious values blight our lives. You take the women and dress them like whores on the street. I don't dress women, they dress themselves. I do not, but you allow it as a norm. The fault line runs deeper even than religion. There are two ways of looking at the world, through faith and superstition, or through the rigors of logic, observation and evidence, through reason. Yet today, reason has a battle on its hands. I want to confront the epidemic of irrational, superstitious thinking. Would you understand somebody on the spirit side with the name Charles? I believe that I give... You really believe it? I believe absolutely Seriously, 100 believe it? that it's true, because it's been proven to me against my rationality. It's a multi-million pound industry that impoverishes our culture. Astrology leans toward the divine and the sacred, words which I know you don't like very much. And throws up new age gurus who exhort us to run away from reality. The tree-ness is the spiritual quality. Or the, uh, or the rockness. Or the rockness. Yeah. As a scientist, I don't think our indulgence of irrational superstition is harmless. I believe it profoundly undermines civilization. Reason and a respect for evidence are the source of our progress, our safeguard against fundamentalists and those who profit from obscuring the truth. We live in dangerous times when superstition is gaining ground and rational science is under attack. In this program, I want to take on the enemies of reason. Three hundred years ago, in the Age of Enlightenment, scientists and philosophers from Galileo to David Hume had the courage to stand up for intellectual principles and reason. The rational science they pioneered has given us tangible benefits. Everything from antibiotics to electricity, sewage systems to sat-nav. And it's not just material progress. Increased life expectancy, health and leisure provided by modern medicine and industrial technology have given more people more time than ever before to educate themselves, express their creativity and ponder existence. And yet, into this better world that reason has built, primitive darkness is coming back, a disturbing pick and mix of superstitions. Where better to start my journey than a New Age fair? Hello, what do you Hello do? What sort there. of readings do you do? All kinds. I do the tarot, yeah. and then I also do the crystal ball. This is George. Hello. What, what can you do for me? All right, well, we can take your aura photograph. All right, I like that, yes. What do I do? Just sit on the throne Just there. Just take a seat, please. Thank you. Shall I take my glasses off? Got here. Right. Now, you have got a couple of spirit guides around you at the moment, because I think there's something in your life changing, but I think this is about you as well, being more comfortable with yourself. Now, what you have here is you have somebody in spirit who's really, really close to you, and they've got their arms around your neck. Well, that's very nice to know. All these people reap the rewards of science and reason, but many here revel in a foggy suspicion of scientific thinking. OK, so, so you, you could teach me how to use my psychic energy? Yes. Is that the idea? Yes. <laughs> you can rely much better on that than on your head. Irrationality is woven into the fabric of modern life. We unthinkingly indulge unscientific delusion. I'm the 
rather schizophrenic Gemini. <laughs> Aquarius. Pisces. Astrology is so pervasive that just about everyone has been indoctrinated with the alleged character of their star sign. They're fiery, a bit unreliable, they love traveling, they're very expansive, they're quite spiritual. Loyal, um, spend too much money, a good leader. They can be a bit moody swinging one way and the other. They can be very bubbly one minute and then a bit down and you never know what you're going to get with them, my husband says. <laughs> A full quarter of the British population claim to believe in astrology. Day in, day out, astrological horoscopes get far more newspaper column inches than science. Amusingly, it falls foul of our modern taboo against lazy stereotyping. How would we react if a newspaper published a daily column that read something like this? Germans. It is in your nature to be hard-working and methodical, which should serve you well at work today. In your personal relationships, especially this evening, you will need to curb your natural tendency to obey orders. Chinese, inscrutability has many advantages, but it may be your undoing today. British, your stiff upper lip may serve you well in business dealings, but try to relax and let yourself go in your social life. And so on through 12 national stereotypes. Of course, the astrology columns are not as offensive as that, but we should ask ourselves exactly where the difference lies. Both are guilty of facile discrimination, dividing humanity up into exclusive groups based on no evidence. I always thought that by the 21st century, science and reason would have long since cleaned up. And yet every day of the week, we're encouraged to retreat into the fog of the superstitious past. Astrology is a primitive belief system made into elaborate pseudoscience. It arrogantly makes humans the focal point of the universe. The movement of planets is supposed to signify petty developments in our career or love life. It was developed in the second century AD by the philosopher Claudius Ptolemy and has not moved on since, despite the discovery of new planets and despite a shift in the Earth's rotational axis that has thrown Ptolemy's zodiac out by 23 degrees. You could ask a question. You could say, who has stolen my money? Um, it never made sense when it was first invented and it makes even less sense now. Read it off as though you mean they get it right. Do you think there's an actual physical influence of the planets that somehow beams down and influences us, uh, people? I think it's very hard to see that. I think if you try to understand astrology as a causal agent, right. I think that's hard to imagine how that would happen. I think you have to look at the planets as signifiers. When you look at the movement of Saturn around the zodiac, it's a very strong signifier of what's going on in individual lives. I don't even understand how they could possibly be signifiers. I mean, how, no. could, how could the rise of Saturn um, possibly be a signifier for something that's going on physiologically in a person's body? The position of planets in, in, in the signs of the work? zodiac. Is, this is what you keep coming back to ask me. How could it how possibly would it work? work? Yes. And I've told you, I don't know. It's a deep, dark mystery. What isn't a deep, dark mystery is why the trite vagaries of newspaper horoscopes seem to chime with readers. Psychologists have identified what's known as the Barnum effect, whereby people tend to believe statements are accurate for them personally, when in fact they're general enough to apply to anyone. We could devise a little experiment where we take your forecasts and then uh, give some of them straight, give some of them randomised, sometimes give Virgo the Pisces forecast, etc., and then ask people um, how accurate they were. Um, yes, that would be a perverse I mean, thing to do, wouldn't it? It would be, it, yes, but I mean, isn't, wouldn't that be a good test? A test of what? Uh, well, how accurate you are. I think that your intention there is mischief, and I think what you'd then get back was mischief. OK, well, my intention would not be mischief. My intention would be experimental test, okay. sci scientific test. Well, but even if it was mischief, how could that possibly influence it? 
I think it does influence it. I think when, whenever you do things with astrology, intentions are strong. I'd have thought you'd be eager. I mean, I'd, I'd have thought you'd really... <laughs> See, what, the fact that you're not makes me think you don't really, in your heart of hearts, believe it. I don't think you, you, you really are prepared to put your reputation on the line. I just don't believe in the experiment, Richard. It's that simple. Well, you're in a kind of no-lose situation then, aren't you? Because... I hope so. Yeah. Regardless of Neil Spencer's concerns, I wanted to conduct a simple trial. We selected 20 people at random. We asked them to read that week's horoscope for Capricorn, but as a test, we said it applied to their own star sign. Not only do you have clever Mercury and ambitious Mars focusing on success, but now the sun is at the same pivotal mid-haven angle of your solar chart. I have no idea what that means. Put simply, this means that this is your moment to go that extra mile to become the person you dream of becoming. Remember, however, that there will be others who want what you have and will stop at nothing to get it. Astrologers say this should fit just Capricorn and not the rest. But what actually happened? Yeah, maybe. To be honest, I felt there's some Mercury energy this week because there's a lot of arguments around and a lot of bad vibes. Um, yeah, that, that, that kind of makes sense. What a lead well junk. It could apply to me as much as to the next person. Was it, yeah, well, in a way, yeah. I, I am, um, <laughs> uh, I'm going on a flamenco course in Spain. That isn't necessarily pertaining to me this week. It's pertaining to me generally. Pan of rubbish. <laughs> the same number of people agreed that the horoscope was accurate for them as disagreed, and similar results are found with proper large-scale experiments. Technically, all but one of our group should have disagreed, namely our only Capricorn. Does it apply to you? Not at this moment, no. Am I taking this too seriously? I believe astrology misleads the public, denies scientific progress and belittles our universe. There's a far richer way of looking at the cosmos. Astronomy is a triumph of the human intellect, a real science, constantly enriched by new evidence. Forget about the astrologers' charts with their constellations and planets moving in and out of this house or that house. Go into a real observatory and look at the Milky Way. Or go out into the country on a moonless night. Just lie on your back and gaze up at the stars. The heart-stopping sight you'd see is a hundred billion stars spinning through an expanding universe at a speed of a million miles per day. The light from some of the closer stars started its journey at the time of the dinosaurs you're staring into a deep time machine. And yet, even as science unravels these natural wonders, our society is drawn to the slim pickings of supernatural belief. Half the British population now say they believe in paranormal phenomena. Over eight million of us have owned up to consulting psychic mediums. Yeah. What I want you to do, Richard, for me is just to pull me out eight of them, please. Simon Goodfellow claims that, with these cards, he can use his psychic powers to tune in to the spirits of dead people around me. Seven, eight. These voices from the past can apparently give him a glimpse of my future. Lovely, Richard, thank you. Now, I feel he's giving me the initial G with his name. OK, now I feel with this man as well. I feel he was a family member. And I also feel very strongly with something to do with advertising that was in, something to do with newspapers with him as well. Now, I do feel with him as well. He's telling me about changes that are coming up in your life at the moment. I see total changes in how you're working to how you will be working in the future. The word Simon seems to be fishing for is retirement, 
the obvious next step for most 60-somethings. It won't be as active and it won't be as active for you. And I do feel you have to grasp that. When it... This could apply to anyone my age, but can Simon back up his more precise statements? What was that um, male relative with a G? That, that, what, what, what was that about you said earlier on? I do, right, the male relative with a G, right. I do feel with him, I don't feel he was a family member, but I do feel with him, right, it was some connection. I thought you said he was a family member, didn't Did you? I say that? Did I, I with a family so, yeah. member? Yeah. I think you did. Um, right, okay. Maybe. Let me see if I can uh, feel him here still. Yes, okay. Right, okay then. What I feel with him, right, I feel as though there was a lot of things. It was a very strong character. Another feeling he's given me is very, it was very regimented as well. And I feel he served in some forces, in the forces in some in way forces. as well. But can you understand anybody with a military background that was connected to you? Well, I've got really nobody military in my background at all, mm. and mm. actually nobody beginning with G either. I don't right, know. OK. Spirit G has rung no bells, but now another voice comes from the ether. Oh, well, she's given me the initial E with the name. Now, I do feel with her as well. It's something to do with I feel a grandparent, and I want to give you an E-sounding name. Uh, my grandmother had a name beginning with E. At last, something I can identify with. Yes, sounding name. Yes, yes. 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 Tell me more about her. I mean, the lady, I do feel with her as well. She had a lot of cats. A lot of, of cats. It's cats. Perhaps not. She never had a cat. She hated cats, as a matter of mm. fact. Um, right. Uh, she liked dogs, but she hated right. cats. Well, I can understand. Not everybody, though. What you've got to also remember with this as well, not everybody can relate to everything that a reader will say. No. Not everybody. I mean, I've had people like yourself... Who have sat extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But here, I seem to get extraordinary excuses. People are quite sceptic. It's always twice as hard as a reader to read for them. Because normally people who come to these events come for a reason. And because, because they want closure and direction in their life. And also what you've got to think about, Richard, as well, some things are very raw to me. Psychics may believe they communicate with the dead, but I've seen no evidence for it. My concern is that, for some people, this superstitious nonsense can be far from harmless fun. There's a network of over 500 spiritualist churches across Britain. Here, Tuesday night is seance night. And we ask that we can now build a bridge between this world and the next, so that we can once again go some way to proving that we survived death and that our loved ones in the spirit are forever with us. Amen. OK, I expect most of you are familiar with spiritualism, but those that... Spiritualism makes a nod to God, then it descends into a darker world. The real draw here is when the dead start talking inside the medium's head. OK, well, the first link that I want to do is I feel I've got somebody giving me the name Charles. And I want a gentleman on the spirit side that passed with chest conditions with this. And there's something about a name that sounds like, it sounds a bit like Devon, but I thought I could hear, it um, could be Dev, Davon or Davenport, something like that. And I feel over, over this side somewhere. Can anybody understand this so far? The lady close to the bookshelf there, would you understand somebody on the spirit side with the name Charles? No, but I have a home in Davenport. You have a home in Davenport? Yeah. OK. Isn't what you're doing cold reading? Well, it depends what you call cold reading. This is something that a lot of the rationalists have come up with, the saying that what you do is you say something and people basically make it fit. So I'll see if I can find the Charles in a minute, but let me just give you a few things that I can feel about you. Has there been a few problems with a stomach condition around you? Because I feel as if I want to go to my stomach and I feel uncomfortable there. Does that make no sense to you whatsoever? No. Well, would you understand then a lady that I want to connect with on Spirit's side that would suffer with the stomach condition yes. because I'm being given the stomach condition, yes. OK? And I feel with this lady I want someone that's a fairly comfortable build, I would say, a bigger build lady, not a slight build lady that's given me this, yes? Yes. Yeah? 
I think when you really examine the evidence of what myself and other mediums do, you will find that a large, large proportion could never be explained away by something like cold reading. It's because there are sometimes such specific details that come through. And I'm seeing like a painting, or a print it would be, of a painting that looks like a Stubbs painting. You know the ones of the horses and the pigs and things like that? The lady in the white at the back there, I'm not around you, am I? Oh, I hate it when I can't find the link. <laughs> Let me see if I, I think if I were talking to someone in the spirit world, I'd say things like, what's it like being dead? Can you see the whole of the universe? Uh, why do you ask them such banal questions? Yeah, good point. But I think what happens is that mediumship comes from the non-rational, non-verbal parts of the brain, if there's such a thing. I believe it's a blending of thoughts between myself and the spirit communicator. But if only it could be just um, like a telephone line. Let me just see if I can get a little bit more information from her first. If you've convinced a person that that's their grandmother to the point that they're actually crying, I mean, surely those tears enough are, are perhaps proof that they've had, they've had proof that that really is their grandmother that's making I the communication. It could, could, could indicate just desperate wishful thinking, perhaps. Now, don't feel I'm with a Stephen Bennett, but I've got those things I want to bring together somehow with particularly a car crash. Your friend Ben died in a car crash and his best friend was called Steve. Your friend Ben Parsons, so, but it's not Bennett, as I said, but it was Ben. Let me see if I can describe um, Ben to see if we can... Beyond whether it's true or false, what concerns me as well is the exploitation of often vulnerable people. Um, can I say, when you were buying the new shoes, had he been on your mind at that time? He's on my mind all the time, really, yeah, but... Yeah, because it's yeah. as if I was particularly felt him around me at that yeah. particular time. That's why I feel I'm, I've got the connection yeah. with that. And, you know, his message is really, in a way, sorry. Because he can't... Do you feel it might actually be damaging to some people, stopping them from letting go after they've lost somebody that they love very much? Um, it's a good point that a lot of people bring up that, but I believe that it does help people to progress and move forward. He gives me the feeling that... Um, but do people move forward, or do they get addicted to a spiritual hit? Most of this congregation are regulars. Craig Hamilton Parker's grasp here seems impressive, until it transpires that he's already read this bereaved girl before. He, um, he actually had a tyre on the left-hand side of his car changed before the accident, and the police thought that it was something to do with that. And I had a message from you before saying it was something to do with the tie. I've given you a message about him before. Okie dokie, I can't remember that. But anyway, I want to sort of feel his... I believe what I do is absolutely true. I believe that I give... You really believe it? I believe absolutely Seriously, 100 percent that it's true. Because it's been proven to me against what I believe is against my rationality. But it's been shown to me so many, many times that life continues. And personal proof that I've had that has given me proof of my father past of continuation of spirit. I mean, incredible things that I are so very personal and subjective, they're hard to argue a case for. But for me, it's been life transforming. And I believe, as I was helped, I can help others. <laughs> Time and again, so-called psychics claim special status outside science and evidence. I have personal proof it's true to me. But as with religion, if it hangs on private feelings that can't be proved or disproved by science, then in what way can it be valid or meaningful to the rest of us? I want to show how scientific reason is always the best way to look at the world and explain the dangers of superstition. I'm often asked how I know that there isn't a spirit world or psychic clairvoyance. Well, I don't. It seems improbable, but unlike the fixed worldviews of mystical faith, science is always open to new possibilities. Scientists test and retest evidence refreshing our understanding of reality. In the 1940s, the American zoologist Donald Griffin demonstrated experimentally that bats use sonar, echolocation of their cries. 
Back then, sonar was brand new military technology, and the theory that it was natural to bats outraged some of Griffin's colleagues. But the more scientists tested the evidence, the more robust the theory became. They found out exactly what the bat cries were like, how they work, how the brain works. Everything about it added up to a complete picture of mutually supporting evidence that this really was a fact. It's this cumulative build-up of corroborating evidence that distinguishes the discovery of bat sonar from alleged paranormal effects. The so-called evidence for psychic phenomena is not robust, but will-o'-the-wisp. The more we look at it, the weaker it becomes. The alleged detection of water through dowsing is not obviously ridiculous. It might work, but does it? The only way to tell is through a rigorous experiment. How does dowsing work? That's the number one question, and nobody can answer you. Well, I reckon that I'm convinced that something is helping me to douse. One of the earlier chaps thinks it's God. How, how do you do it, and then? How, what, what's your principle of dowsing? I think the question, and I expect God to respond in a way that I understand. I'm going to expect the right-hand one to point to the camera and the left-hand one straight forward. One... Yeah, OK. Look, Very look, good. it's following him round. Yeah. Have you done the test yet in the tent? Yes, I did. Yeah, and what, what was the result? I was going to get six right, 100%. Yeah, and what happened? One. So what do you make of that, then? He's having his laugh, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he loves a joke. Yes. You don't realise. <laughs> Do I get second goes? Oh, yeah, you can have as many goes. The psychologist Chris French thinks there may be a simpler explanation. He has devoted his career to investigating claims of the paranormal. And now he has set up this test for dowsing, a properly controlled double blind trial. In each of these rows, just one container, chosen at random, holds a bottle of water. All the rest contain sand. Neither the dowsers nor the tester are allowed to know where the water is until the boxes are opened. So there are no unintentional giveaways. Have another go. <laughs> Safeguards like this make the double blind trial one of the crowning achievements of scientific reason. Okay, put it on the end one then. Put Number it on six, the six again. I'd say so. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> What you'll typically find when you talk to dowsers is they'll give you lots and lots of anecdotal evidence, lots of stories about how they discovered a leak sure. in their, yeah. their neighbour's pipes and, and so on and so forth, but there are always other possible explanations there. Yes. What we're trying to do is set up conditions which would rule out yes. any of those other yes. explanations. But then we get down to the, the very fundamental basic issue, can the dowsers actually do what they think they can do? Yes. So shall we see how well you've done? This is, is sand. In that case, in that case, I can't do this. This is the waters in number five. Sand again. <laughs> this time, guess was in number three. And this time, water. you're correct. Well that's water. Okay, that's sand. Yes, we've actually got two possible worlds. Final it's trial. It's sand again. I'm afraid. In that case, I'm 100 percent wrong again. Uh, well, you've got one right on yeah, out of six, which is what we'd expect by chance. So far, they're performing pretty much in line with mean chance expectation, okay. in other words, guesswork. Yeah. So no one has scored more than yeah. two hits out yeah. of six. Three. Three. The people you've been testing, do they understand why they're being put through the double-blind procedure? I think once we've explained it to them, then they appreciate why someone who is perhaps sceptical or doubtful about their claims would see that that was necessary. What's interesting is it doesn't actually tend to dent their confidence at all. Which suggests that they're completely sincere. I, mean, that I think they, they are completely sincere. Yes. And that they're typically very, very surprised yes. when we run them through a series of trials and actually say at the end of the day, well, your performance is no better than would expect just on the basis of, of guesswork. And then what typically happens is they'll make up all kinds of reasons, yeah. some might say excuses, as to why they didn't pass that particular test. I feel the whole test is wrong. I'm shocked beyond words that this has happened. 
but I did say from the outset, couldn't we just sort out some grey blocks and some scaffold boards yeah. so that I can walk above it, which is what I would routinely do and I've yeah. done for 40 years. Yeah. Who knows where or what bottles were in what tubs. That's the whole so point, the isn't tub. it? That's the well, whole yeah, point. But if you understand dozing like I do, you'll understand that everything leaves an image. This state of denial is extraordinary. Even when confronted with hard fact, these dowsers prefer not to face up to truth, but retain their delusion. Rather than adapt to evidence, many of us, it seems, remain trapped in ways of thinking inherited from our primitive ancestors. Irrational belief, from dowsing to psychic clairvoyance, has roots in early mankind's habit of attributing spirit and intention to natural phenomena such as water, the sun, a rock or the sea. The sea has often been thought to be a malevolent force actively out to get you. In 480 BC, King Xerxes of the Persians built a pontoon bridge across the Hellespont and a rough sea came and, and wrecked it. And King Xerxes was so furious that he sentenced the sea to 300 lashes. I wonder whether there's something of King Xerxes in all of us to this day. We don't want to believe that things just happen. We want to believe that there's some kind of deliberate intention behind everything, even where inanimate objects are concerned. And perhaps that is the key to humanity's belief in the supernatural. Even in the 21st century, despite all that science has revealed about the indifferent vastness of the universe, the human mind remains a wanton storyteller, creating intention in the randomness of reality. The delivery of rewards by a one-armed bandit is determined at random, but many gamblers want to think that what they do can increase their chances of winning the jackpot. They stand on one leg or wear a lucky shirt. Are these superstitious behaviors a byproduct of our evolution? All wild animals have to be kind of natural statisticians, looking for patterns in the apparent randomness of nature when they're looking for food or trying to avoid predators. There are two kinds of mistakes they can make. They can either fail to detect pattern when there is some, or they can seem to detect pattern when there isn't any, and that's superstition. Sixty years ago, the American psychologist B.F. Skinner investigated the behavior of pigeons, rewarding them with food when they learned to peck a key in the feeding apparatus. But then Skinner set the apparatus to reward the birds at random. Now the pigeons just had to sit back and wait. But that isn't what they did. Instead, the majority developed what Skinner called superstitious behavior. When an individual pigeon, for example, happened to look over its left shoulder and the reward mechanism just happened to click in at that point, it would have got the idea that it was looking over the left shoulder that had got it the reward, so it tried it again. By sheer luck, as it happened, the reward mechanism delivered food at the same time again. And so the pigeon was reinforced in its idea that looking over the left shoulder was what got it the reward. And it went on and on and turned into a maniac for looking over the left shoulder. Humans can be no better than pigeons. We constantly create false positives. We touch wood for luck, see faces in toasted cheese, fortunes in tea leaves. These provide a comforting illusion of meaning. This is the human condition. We desperately want to feel there's an organizing force at work in our bewilderingly complex world. And in the irrational mindset, 
If you believe in the mystical pattern you've imposed on reality, you call yourself spiritual. Spirituality is a prized commodity. The media tell us to respect spiritual souls and their apparently deep insights. Spiritual self-help guides do a roaring trade in the material world, outnumbering science books by three to one. But what does spirituality actually mean? So please take your seat and please come slowly and gently uh, so that we can start the proceeding without losing time. So could you please... Um, Satish Kumar is the editor of Resurgence, an ecological magazine at the sandal-wearing end of the Green Movement, and he counts amongst his many fans Prince Charles and the Dalai Lama. I represent the entire history of evolution. I was present in the beginning, the first Big Bang, and I'll be here for billions of years to come. But isn't Satish's spirituality just about imposing yet another superstitious false positive? The world is made of two elements. One element is visible element. The other aspect of creation is invisible dimension, things we cannot see. So, so what is that element which is invisible? I call it spiritual. When you go in a room, you say, there is a good feeling here. There's a spirit of ah, the room. Well, now you've changed to something rather different. The, the spirit is a very big and very holistic and very inclusive word. It is not defined in a one particular way. So when you go in a room, you can say, the tree has a spirit. A, a rock has a spirit. It's a living rock for me. Nature without spirit cannot exist. Like a tree cannot exist without the sunlight, it cannot exist without rain, it cannot exist without soil. Also, it cannot exist without the tree-ness. The tree-ness is the spiritual quality. Or, uh, or the rock-ness. Or the rock-ness. When you talk about the rock-ness or the quality of a rock, uh, I can see as a scientist a rock has hardness and things like that, but I think that's not quite what you mean. Um, it sounds as though what you do mean is something imposed by the human observer. A rock is, 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 but, is but atoms. But there is a rock quality in the rock. Well, you, th that's a matter of assertion. I mean, you, you are now simply asserting that. Asserting, I'm understanding it. This is my yeah. understanding. Okay. Some may understand more fully than others, but it is not imposed. It is there. It all sounds very poetic, but it's not reality. Like priests, mullahs and rabbis, New Age mystics ceaselessly attempt to fill gaps in human understanding with fabricated meaning. Science and rationality are often accused of having a cold, bleak outlook. But why is it bleak to face up to the evidence of what we know? The word mundane has come to mean boring and dull. And it really shouldn't, it should mean the opposite. Because it comes from the Latin mundus, meaning the world. And the world is anything but dull. The world is wonderful. There's real poetry in the real world. Science is the poetry of reality. And yet today, science is under attack. In the last 50 years, science has put a man on the moon, cloned a sheep, decoded the human genome. And yet, sadly, the white heat of the 1960s seems to be treated as a white elephant today. What colour do you see, guys? Anything, it looks most Okay, it's, it's blue, yellow, and blue. A prejudice against science is evident in schools. Physics A-levels have halved in the last 25 years, chemistry fallen by more than a third. University departments are closing all around the country. 
And last but not least... This is a betrayal of the Enlightenment. The fundamental problem, I think, lies with the fashion throughout our educational system to teach students to value private feeling more highly than evidence-based reason. This is rooted in the postmodern relativist agenda. For relativists, scientific truth is just a patriarchal Western orthodoxy that, like the old Roman Catholic Church, stands in the way of other equally valid outlooks on the world. With things like the paranormal, the drive for alternative medicine, all these kinds of movements away from the orthodoxy in science, I see it a lot as like the Protestant Reformation was vis-a-vis -vis Roman Catholicism. Internet, in a way, is kind of functioning as a kind of information source, very much like the printing press did in the 15th century and 16th century, that is in a sense empowering people to sort of look up stuff for themselves in terms of different kinds of treatments and things like that, and, and in a way not trusting the experts anymore. And well, look, why do I have to trust, you know, the GP? Why do I have to trust the Royal Society? I think you're so close to being right, but yet you're <laughs> down wrong. You're absolutely wrong. Um, I would like to take that ball and run with it in a different direction. Yes, we want to question authority. We don't want to say, because this person is the president of the Royal Society, therefore what he says is right. We've got to go back to the evidence and find out what is actually true. The problem is, of course, people may look at the same evidence and then reach a somewhat different conclusion from what the head of the Royal Society reached. And so they will say, well, look, you know, I looked at the evidence too, and I'm not persuaded by this. That's where you start getting a kind of an opening up uh, of science. Steve Fuller is, of course, right that the internet is revolutionizing how we use and consume information. But the impersonal algorithms of internet search engines do not weed out robust evidence from unsourced, uncorroborated assertion. Wikipedia World presents both great opportunity and huge danger. Paranoid conspiracy theories circulate unchallenged. Sometimes they're relatively harmless, like the rumor that NASA faked the moon landings, which is a bit of a joke because the evidence for going to the moon is so strong. But how about the malicious and utterly unfounded rumor that 4,000 Jews were tipped off by Israeli agents not to go to work in the World Trade Center on 9-11? It's one of the nasty lies circulating as truth in the blog community of racists and religious fundamentalists. Now such people can find each other anywhere in the world instantly, whipping up scares and reinforcing their paranoia and delusions. As evidence is devalued, even medical progress has become a target. Her lungs had gone into spasms, she was vomiting. Hundreds of families blame the MMR vaccines for autism, brain damage and meningitis. When one report, now widely discredited, wrongly linked MMR vaccine with autism, an innuendo circulated that the establishment was conspiring to risk our children's health. It led to hundreds of thousands of parents failing to protect their offspring from the threat of measles, a serious disease that, in Afghanistan, kills 35,000 people a year. This is the world of private hunches and no respect for evidence. Reason has built the modern world. It is a precious but also a fragile thing, which can be corroded by apparently harmless irrationality. We must favor verifiable evidence over private feeling. Otherwise, we leave ourselves vulnerable to those who would obscure the truth.
There exists a hidden world of microorganisms beyond what we can see with our unaided eyes. Over a hundred years ago, this world was discovered through the progress of science. It was a huge leap forward for mankind. Scientific medicine came to understand how germs cause disease. We washed our hands, sterilized surgery, and created vaccines, antibiotics, and drugs that work. Life expectancy doubled in less than 50 years. But now the happy story starts to falter. Today, a war is being fought against reason. Science is treated with suspicion, perhaps born of fear, and medical advance is challenged by the march of irrational belief. A third of us now spend over 1.6 billion pounds a year on superstitious alternative remedies, which, as far as the evidence can show, don't work. OK? Yep. Good. Have you asked any angels to come close to you? No. No, well, you haven't got any then. If any remedy is tested under controlled scientific conditions and proved to be effective, it will cease to be alternative and will simply become medicine. So-called alternative medicine either hasn't been tested or it has failed its tests. There wasn't a control, it was just an outcome. It was just, it was just a pilot study. Right. So that's not really a no, proper, no. proper trial. And some alternatives are funded by us taxpayers even though their unproven claims question the known laws of physics. You might think I'm gulling the patient. I don't claim that it's much more than a hypothesis. What I do say is that I have quite considerable evidence that homeopathy does work, and I'm sure that it's safe. Today, while we indulge unproven healing magic, tried and tested scientific medicine is under attack. In this programme, I want to look at how health has become a battleground between reason and superstition. Ah. You come here to move through time and through space. Allow the eyes to gently close. Smile your very best smile. Swallow the smile with some saliva into the heart and let the heart smile back at you. And there's a warm and a welcoming feeling. Joy without end. Grace, beauty, laughter. The deep knowing of the wise being that you are. And the golden glow that comes from the heart comes from a golden flower. And use the gold light from the center of the flower like a sunbeam and beam it onto those petals and wake them up. There is a second part that's very personal. And this is to step inside the pearl itself. Because if you step inside the pearl, you could find out who you are. Elisis Livingston is a professional faith healer. She runs the Shambhala Retreat in Glastonbury. For £140 a day, she treats patients, including those with terminal cancer, with a mix of meditation, spiritual healing, and the playing of recorded chants. She believes she can alter the structure of DNA. Quite an experience. Isn't it? Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. DNA is very interesting right now in our, the evolution of the human race. Um, Every human being, except um, a very small percentage, has a double helix in the cell. We and don't all have. Oh, yeah. everyone. You said a very small percentage. Oh, no, a very small percentage do not. Really? They have got more strands. Um, we used to have, in Atlantis, 12 strands, and they're in the form of four triangles facing in, in each cell. And we forgot who we were in the experiment after Atlantis, mm -hmm. and everything changed. Reincarnation was introduced. The soul I know what you're thinking. This woman is way out. I expected a serious program about the attack on science, and here's Richard Dawkins just picking on an easy target. But these ideas are not so weird in the irrational world of alternative health. In fact, they're commonplace. 
Is Elise's theory of DNA from Atlantis any more irrational than the Ayurvedic notion of chakras, seven spinning energy wheels inside us? They're certainly great money spinners. How do we know all this? Where, where does all this come from? Um, it comes from the Akashic record, the record of all vibration on this planet. Uh, we also have knowing. In, when we were doing the heart meditation, you go into the deep knowing. And the deep knowing, it really can't be argued. What you know, I know that you realise this, of course, you know. Well, I, I, I know that DNA is a double helix, but that's only been known since 1953. So How is her evidence, the knowing of this Akashic record, any worse than the evidence for homeopathic claims that the more you dilute an active ingredient, the more effective it becomes? Both depend on faith. ...for all things and all activations of spirit. Apparently, I'm only a few DNA strands short of the full Atlantean quota. Elisis kindly agrees to top me up. So, let's put the last triangle in. And it's done. <laughs> Let me know in six months how you're feeling. I'll, 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 I'll wait and see if I get any any, yes, any, any effects. <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, it's not all wacky, quacky fun. Today, alternative or rather unproven remedies are fast becoming mainstream implicitly casting doubt on scientific medicine. Surveys reveal that a third of us spend an incredible 1.6 billion pounds a year on the kind of therapeutic stabs in the dark touted here in Glastonbury. It's mostly angels. I want to find out why such superstitious nonsense is mounting a growing challenge to scientific medicine. Once, society exalted scientists as heroes. Their insights fuel tangible progress from clean water to networked computing, self-evident benefits that we now take for granted. Yet, as science has moved on, it's become more complex and difficult to grasp. It's easier to portray scientists as the people who bring us Frankenstein food, pollute the environment, or conduct sinister experiments on defenseless little animals. In the war being fought against reason, even medicine is now under attack. Media cause celebre, from side effects to superbugs, have bred widespread cynicism about medical progress. So much so that in 1998, the publicizing of one survey of 12 children that wrongly linked MMR vaccine with autism prompted hundreds of thousands of parents to opt their children out of entirely sensible inoculations. A hyped-up insinuation that the government and the medical establishment were conspiring to sacrifice our next generation to autism has left up to a fifth of our children entirely unprotected against rubella, mumps and measles, a disease with complications such as brain injury and deafness. This is what measles looks like, a potentially fatal illness now in... The number of parents inoculating their children with MMR quickly fell. There have now been epidemics in Kent and Yorkshire and a first death from measles in 14 years. Now everybody's more confused because muddies the water, it's frightening. See the boy on the telly in there. It's an acute example of the danger of devaluing evidence. Where once there was reason, now there is confusion. One of the things that struck me right from the outset was how extraordinary it was that this scare got abroad when there were, it was so insubstantial. I mean, there was really no scientific basis for it whatsoever. I find it very easy to sympathise with patients who were scared, partly because the media built it up, but also because 
having your child vaccinated is a positive act. It's something that you did to the child. And so somehow that's, that's more scary than, than, than a sin of omission. Very much, and I think that's even more the case these days when people are much less familiar with the diseases against which their children have been protected by immunization. You know, it's a, a generation or two since people had much experience of measles and mumps and rubella on any significant scale. And so when somebody comes along and says, well, you know, this immunization may cause some other problem, then they're more likely to be susceptible to that. Why do you think that sort of thing happens in our society today? I think that there's a climate of anxiety, but particularly focused on issues of health. Uh, generally, people feel, I think, more isolated, more atomized, more individuated, perhaps, than they did before. And these anxieties and concerns often focus on their health. This is a paradox of early 21st century life. We now have the luxury of irrational anxiety about our health and can dabble in faddish, unscientific remedies, precisely because scientific medicine allows us to live longer and more healthily. Our fears are fed by newspapers, which wildly exaggerate the risks of scientific medicine and meanwhile churn out acres of positive coverage of alternative therapies. In any other field, politics, say, or the next move on interest rates, journalists would ask hard questions and demand answers. But alternative medicine has managed to lodge itself in the less rigorous lifestyle and celebrity pages, essentially free advertising. It's little wonder that alternative health fairs like this are flourishing across the country. What, what's your line? What do you it's do here? It's magnetic therapy. What is psychic energy? What are these wands used for? People may come here with real health problems, but what do they get? remedies that appear to have no basis in science or evidence. People putting these in a cat's bed, they'll find the animals will go to the bed with the magnets in it. Has that, that been done properly with controlled trials, is it? No, not been controlled trials. They've got ancient wisdom that we don't. Right. <laughs> I've always liked the saying that we should be open-minded, but not so open-minded that our brain falls out. So do we all have an angel hovering on our shoulder or something? Is that we what have several. Right. Yes. 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 OK, can, uh, how many have I got? Can, can you tell? Or, or do... Have you asked any angels to come close to you? No. No, well, you haven't got any then. Oh, OK. The idea is yeah. that we all have some form of angelic guidance, angelic guidance, some form of guidance that help us travel our life path. You might need strength, you might need forgiveness, you might need hope all the way through your lifetime. And the angels, as we perceive them, are those energy bands. They're parts of ourselves, they're fragments of ourselves that we can call upon and amplify to help us walk our path. These energies are a little bit like tea. You can have herb teas, you can have decaf teas, you can have all sorts of different flavours and strengths and varieties of teas. But they're all Remember, this is a multi-billion pound industry. Yet, 80% of alternative remedies have never subjected themselves to controlled scientific trials. They depend entirely on subjective word of mouth. Oh, that feels nice. Hunches and private feeling, which may be prone to bias or possibly even delusion. The scientific method, by contrast, tests with objective experiment and statistical analysis what is effective and what is not. Individual scientists may or may not be honest, but science, with its safeguards of peer review and repeating experiment, has scrupulous honesty built into it by design. Science replaces private prejudice with publicly verifiable evidence. Untested and unverified, yet desperately seeking credibility, alternative remedies follow in the rich tradition of organized religion and set up intricate belief systems. 
they substitute real science with pseudoscience. Face up or face down? You face up right. and you sit here. Now just guide your head so you don't go. This matters because in the process they deny fact and misuse science. But that, isn't that pointing up? I just have to go there to check. In flaunting words like energy, vibration, vortex, they exploit and also distort some of science's great discoveries. The sleep, I'm sure, is therapeutic. But how could these illuminated crystals be energizing my chakras, as advertised? Manjia Samantha Lawton is a conventionally trained former GP who now speculates on the science behind alternative fads. She asserts that chakras in our bodies are something like black holes. Yes, as in the big ones that suck in everything in space. We used to think of black holes as the great guzzlers of the universe, that they actually um, started uh, to suck in everything around it. Uh, what we're finding now is that black holes are in the centre of every single galaxy and they occur in all sizes. So black holes have become into a creative principle. A, a creative principle? A creative principle. What does that mean? That we're realising that black holes have something to do with creating matter in the galaxy. And this is very, very new. And uh, what I'm suggesting is that black holes are creative at every level, even within our own bodies, which is what perhaps the chakras are. So whereabouts yeah. in, in my body might there be a black hole? Well, the idea from esoteric knowledge is that chakras are centres in the body that are um, spinning, which is why they're called wheels, chakras. And uh, they are different colours and they relate to different parts of the body. So there are traditionally seven chakras at different parts of the body. The universe is a deeply mysterious place and a deeply wonderful place and scientists have always been struggling to understand it. Don't you feel that there's enough real mystery to investigate without importing what sounds to me horribly like mumbo-jumbo? Yes, I can understand that you think it's mumbo-jumbo, but there's plenty of people who are now getting interested in these topics. They are part of our universe. Okay, well, and they're certainly part of the they universe, are part of the universe. Whether what they do has any value, I mean, um, that's up to you. <laughs> well, it's not really up to me. It's up to science, and it's, it's up, up to, to evidence. It's and, up to science. What worries me is the beguiling misuse of scientific language to prop up entirely unscientific belief systems. In the Middle Ages, healers would conjure up evil spirits or magical spells. Now, in the 21st century, it seems they turn to black holes and, above all, quantum physics. Quantum theory accounts for the anomalous behaviour of light and atoms. It's astonishingly accurate, but notoriously difficult to grasp. But Deepak Chopra, who once qualified as a doctor, has seized upon quantum jargon and applied it to healing. He claims disease can be caused and cured by a shift in consciousness. If you believe in the rock, you're automatically believing in God. Chopra has managed to become a one-man alternative health industry. He's worth up to $75,000 per lecture, and in this era of self-absorption, he claims Michael Jackson, Madonna, and Hillary Clinton as followers. If you feel genuinely attractive, you'll attract other people to you. The great American physicist Richard Feynman once said, if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. Isn't Deepak Chopra just exploiting quantum jargon as plausible sounding hocus pocus? Quantum healing is a theory that a shift in consciousness creates a shift in biology. That's it. We try and get into every aspect of a patient's life, their relationships, their hopes, their dreams, 
and uh, then we combine it with a ritual of uh, deep meditation, massage, and really a lot of spiritual counseling, including the fear of death. We think that uh, many times uh, patients uh, uh, feel healed even though they may die from a disease if they learn to go beyond their personal fear of death. And you can never do that unless you uh, have a patient have a spiritual experience. Where did the quantum theory come into that? I... Oh, it's just a metaphor, just like uh, a, an electron or a photon is an indivisible unit of information and energy. A thought is an indivisible unit of consciousness. Oh, so it's an it's a metaphor for a, for a unit. It's nothing to do with quantum theory as in physics. No, I think quantum theory has a lot of uh, things to say about observer effect. There are a school of physicists who believe that quantum leaps, for example, are examples of discontinuity. And uh, creativity in consciousness is also an example of discontinuity. And that healing may be a biological phenomenon that uh, relies on biological creativity. That at very fundamental levels it may be a discontinuous phenomenon. It's something unpredictable that happens in the proliferation of uncertainty. So it sounds like a sort of poetic use of the word discontinuity. It's, it's actually confusion, isn't it, to bring in um, quantum theory other than as a metaphor. But it sounds as though you're both doing it as a metaphor and a, a little tinge of, of something like what physicists are talking about as well. Well, I think there's controversy. The aficionados in the world of quantum physics have somehow hijacked the word for their own use. Oh, OK. So they've hijacked your word I quantum. think what happens is that there are fundamentalists in science. Uh, that is absolutely wrong. Science's quest is to try to sort out, to tease out those bits that we don't I understand. Science and work has become out. so arrogant in its um, in its premise that it has all the answers in a mechanistic approach that it has, whilst it has gotten rid of lots of things like polio and malaria and tuberculosis in many parts of the world, uh, we are now seeing the emergence of modern epidemics that are a result of some of the things that have come about through science. Chopra, at least, wears his disdain for Western science openly. The rest of us are prone to politely blurring the vital distinction between science and mumbo-jumbo. If you want to pay for unproven potions and use them in the privacy of your own home, all well and good. But such is the power of the alternative medical lobby that one seemingly bizarre remedy has become embedded in our National Health Service. Now I want to find out why we're all paying tax to fund other people's gullibility. I agree there is a plausibility problem, you know, and I pinch myself from time to time. I quite regularly pinch myself. You know, is this really happening? It's the hottest alternative health fad. It boasts an impressively vast and well-stocked medical cabinet. It's endorsed by royalty and the stars and is doing a booming trade in high street pharmacies. 500 million people worldwide claim to use it. What is it? It's a system for dosing up on a dilute solution of water. Welcome to the bizarre world of homeopathy. Homeopathy was dreamed up in the late 18th century as a way of boosting the body's vital spirit. One of the central tenets handed down by its founder, Samuel Hahnemann, was that like cures like. Superficially, this might sound faintly plausible, but unlike a vaccine that introduces a diminished form of a virus into the body in order to provoke its immune system, like cures like makes the unfounded assumption that what causes similar symptoms can cure those symptoms. In Hahnemann's world, Dilute poison ivy cures skin rash because, undiluted, it causes a rash if touched. By the same principle, red onion can alleviate streaming eyes and snake venom stiffness. But amazingly, homeopathy gets even stranger still. Homeopaths claim that the more you dilute an active ingredient in water, the stronger medicine it becomes. Most homeopathic remedies are marked 30C. What does that mean? 
It means one part medicine to a hundred to the power of 30 parts water. How much? A drop in a fish tank? No? A fish tank is nowhere near big enough. A swimming pool doesn't provide enough dilution. Not even a lake. What about a drop in the ocean? But it turns out that even the sea isn't big enough. For the really approved homeopathic recipes, in order to get one molecule of the active substance, you need to imbibe all the atoms in the solar system. To science, just doesn't make sense. Even homeopaths acknowledge that there is not a single molecule of active ingredient in the bottle they sell you. It's just water. So how can it possibly work? In an attempt to resolve the paradox, homeopathy boldly paddles further up the creek of pseudoscience, claiming that water somehow has a memory of the now completely absent active ingredient. But wouldn't water also have memory of other, more common impurities it's come into contact with? Salt, urine. Scientists have calculated that in each glass of water we drink, at least one molecule has passed through the bladder of Oliver Cromwell. Incredibly, you and I are paying for this unproven industry through our taxes. Despite the National Health Service's net £540 million deficit for 2006, the refurbishment of the Royal Homeopathic Hospital was part funded by the NHS to the tune of £10 million. That's equivalent to 500 nurses' salaries. Right here on the floor, here's a point to illustrate. Wooden floors, very unusual in a modern healthcare facility. This hospital was only completed 18 months ago. So this is our main clinical area. The homeopathic profession is unregulated by government. You can call yourself a homeopath without any qualification, training or even insurance. After all, all you're doing is dishing out water solution. But Peter Fisher, clinical director of the hospital, is a medically trained rheumatologist. I see Prince Charles over there. Yep. Oh, yes, great friend of ours. <laughs> These are the, the homeopathic medicines that are in you know, daily use. This is one, you know, for instance, it has quite a strong evidence base, rust toxin, which is poison ivy. Right, OK. Um, I want to know how someone highly qualified in real medicine can make such a leap of faith. I agree there is a plausibility problem, you know, and I pinch myself from time to time. I quite regularly pinch myself. You know, is this really happening? You know, the fact is I couldn't stop what I do now, even if I wanted to. This, my patients wouldn't let me. Yeah. They say it helped. So how are things? Well, very much better since we last saw you. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I virtually no pain at all. You know, if I'm aware of the symptoms are going to start again, I start taking it again, and, and I can feel the improvement, and then mm. I'll go back to it until I need it again. You know. Good. Oh well, that's pretty straightforward. We just bash on the same, don't we? Yeah. I'm still taking the remedies, but you said to me. Um, you know, if you get mini, if you get little reactions, mm. just hold off taking the remedies until they then yeah. subside. So therefore, I've been doing that. So, for example, I haven't had a remedy for a week now. And uh, last time we met, you said you were getting a bit of an emotional sort of upset yeah. the day after you took the, the medicine. It was the day after I took the medicine. That I was impressed by the amount of time and care Peter Fisher devotes to each patient, far more than an ordinary doctor. Um, but in terms of the treatment, I would be you know, reluctant to make a big change. I think this is the right stuff and we may need to fiddle around with it. Like a GP, Peter Fisher prescribes medicine. But in this case, the medicine is a bit of a surprise. Thank you very much. Good. Common salt, natrium muriaticum, sodium chloride, again in an ultramolecular dilution. I mean, obviously, since it's common salt, I mean, she's obviously taking in a hell of a lot of common salt anyway. Yes, oh, sure. Um, how, how does the one 
Well, <laughs> the truth is nobody knows. I don't know, nor does anybody else. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, the question is, do you think that because we don't know, because it seems implausible, it can't work? And that may be where you and I differ. That's Actually, right. the, the most recent problem was your skin, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, my hands, they've cleared up quite well. And my scalp's in, in, yeah. a lot, lot better. While patients like these provide positive anecdotes for homeopathy, subjective stories are not enough for science. I want to pin down precisely what double-blind trials have been conducted. Over a hundred have been done, some by me. On the whole, they're positive. And I have, you know, I, I've worked hard on it. Um, but in the face of great scepticism, in the face of many people who say, oh, well, yeah, we're not going to fund homeopathy, it's got to be a load of rubbish. Why do you think they say that if there really are controlled trials which, which show... Well, I think you're, you're, you're a much better place to comment on because you're the sort of person who says that. Well, because I, I have read studies which have sort of meta-analyses and things which suggest that, yes, occasionally there's a slight suggestion of something, maybe in a slight suggestion there, but if you take the, all the studies that have been done, it doesn't add up in the way that... Oh, I, I don't ag agree with that at all. Now, if a double-blind controlled trial really does show that it works, then that suggests we're dealing with an entirely new force of physics, something unknown to science. Well, I think there's a slight exaggeration. I mean, there are, there are various hypotheses. Remarkably, nobody knows what the structure of liquid water is. So there is, there is room you know, for, for a phenomenon analogous to, I'm not saying the same, but analogous to the storage of information by a magnetic medium, by a floppy disk or a video tape. Yes. If I were a doctor, doing what you do and was convinced that it really worked. I would, I would drop everything and really, really try to demonstrate it and, and win the Nobel Prize for physics. I and mean, it would be an astonishing, totally astonishing uh, that's, finding. That's, uh, to be honest, one of the main reasons I got into it. Plain ambition got me into it in the first place. But I agree, it would be nice to see, you know, a really serious program of research done, done on it. Well, it, you're saying it has been done and... Well, no, I'm saying that quite a lot of research ha has been done it's, I don't claim it's conclusive. Well, why, why not? I mean, it sounds as though... Well, because it's very diffuse. And, of course, it does depend what question you're asking. You know, are you saying, does it benefit people? Do people feel better? And I think, actually, there's, there's no doubt about that, that people who, who go to homeopathic hospitals who have homeopathic treatment do feel better. But, of course, you will say that's all because you're nice to them. This is all rather contradictory, so let's be clear about the latest evidence. In 2005, the medical journal The Lancet surveyed all the meta-analyses, the analyses of the analyses, and failed to find any reliable effect of homeopathy. Tellingly, for me, in the bigger trials, less prone to chance anomalies, homeopathy was more likely to show zero demonstrable effect. And yet, despite the lack of robust evidence, homeopathy thrives. Many clinicians look on in horror at the unlevel playing field of trials and evidence for medical licensing. In 2004, American trials seemed to show that the drug Herceptin could halve the death rate for a particularly virulent form of breast cancer. This was a major breakthrough. Patients understandably clamored for the new drug, but unlike in the world of homeopathy, the claims of scientific medicine are tested rigorously, and that takes time. Accordingly, the license was delayed. We went through a period of a year or two when Herceptin, quite rightly in my opinion, uh, was held up for the treatment of breast cancer until all the evidence was there. So we had extremely rigid cost-effectiveness analysis before we could use Herceptin. And, OK, there was a short passage of time when it seemed unfair. But you compare that when actually lives are lost because we're talking about life-threatening disease with drugs which actually save lives to the way that ineffective, irrational remedies are just being nodded through. I mean, it makes you weep. The pharmaceutical industry takes a lot of knocks. And yes, drugs are very expensive. But the reason they're so expensive is there may be 20 years of R&D to get to an effective product. Every step of the way is checked and double-checked. And now, through the back door, we're getting a class of compound being allowed into the marketplace with a license, with no such evidence of efficacy. I can't understand how you could even... But if homeopathy isn't tested properly or flunks its trials, then why do homeopaths remain popular?
substances, a lot of them owe their success not to the homeopathy, but to the fact they are decent people. They have time, they're compassionate, they look the patient in the eye, they talk to someone for an hour. These are nice people. I would like to recruit these really nice people to practice proper medicine. And then in the end, what we've got are proper doctors, empathetic doctors, who will, in addition to the placebo effect of being that kind of physician, they can also add in truly effective drugs. Clinical trials show that homeopathy simply cannot match up with safe chemical drugs. Yet in the realm of petty ailments like sore eyes or itchy scalp, homeopathy is probably innocent enough. Because it's really all about attentive doctors spending time listening to the patient. That one is still, the right one is still a tiny bit puffy, isn't it? Or is it? Well, it's always like that. Then giving them something that makes them feel better, precisely because it's supposed to make them feel better. I think it's all down to the placebo effect. I want to find out if that's the key to alternative medicine's grip on public confidence. I would disagree with you that I think something is being done. And why are we so good at placebo and the orthodox medicine is oh, not? Oh, well, they're, they're pretty good at it too. Alternative health remedies are swamping us. We've seen how most are not properly tested, how they undermine science and delude the public. Hi. Hello. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. You want a health kinesiology session? I'd like to, yes, Do you please. know what it is? Um, I'm hoping to learn. OK. Have a lie down. Thank you. But the irony may be that in this very delusion lies their success. What we do in kinesiology is we clear energy blockages in the meridian system. There are 14 meridians or energy pathways that run up and down the body. Can they be seen um, with a microscope? Can you sort of um, look at them and... I don't no. think so. No. I, don't, I don't think so. No, okay. okay. Unlike the library, all right, I've got all these energy patterns yes, okay. stored in me and you okay. are just picking the one okay. that you want. And we have baker's yeast here, all right? So I'm just going to touch a point right by your ear. This is the test for allergy. There's just no tension. It just releases completely. OK, do you want this fixed? Yes, please. OK. I have to admit, I'm rather enjoying this kinesiology. I feel very relaxed. But what is helping me here? The tapping of my feet? The feel of a kind woman's hands? or some sort of expectation that what it's doing is therapeutic. What I'm talking about is the placebo effect, treatment through the power of suggestion. And I'm going to hold points on your head, OK? Right here and here. And what I want you to do is think the phrase, fear of being ignored. Human beings have evolved extraordinarily sophisticated self-healing mechanisms. Above all, a powerful immune system. Fear of being ignored. Could it be that interaction with any kind of healer acts to focus our self-healing abilities? Some evolutionary psychologists believe this may be the entirely rational explanation behind irrational remedies. Fear of being ignored. works because most of medicine, in fact, is a case of self-cure. When we, the pain goes down after taking placebo medicine, or under the influence of acupuncture, for example, it's our own minds which have reduced the pain. Yes, surely what you're saying is that we get better anyway. Why then would alternative medicine be better? Surely an, an ordinary doctor might do that. Real medicine does the same. But I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, underestimate the powers, and sometimes the superior powers, of people who go under funny names or have funny authorities written up on the wall and so on, because some people respond to that information much more than they would to the conventional information in a doctor's surgery. Nevertheless, I sort of have a sort of hankering after what's actually true. How far do you think so-called alternative practitioners believe the mumbo-jumbo that they, that they say is the theory behind their potions and how far do they know that it's a placebo? Are, are they deceiving or are they self-deceiving? I think in many cases they're self-deceiving. Well, it's not even self-deceiving. They have seen in their own experience that these treatments work, so they believe in them. Um, they 
have then to invent a rationale, some spiritual or magical explanation of what they're doing. You know, supposing you were a miracle worker in the two or three thousand years ago, supposing you were Jesus and seeing that you know, lame men got up and walked when you told them to, you'd be rather impressed with yourself, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, yes. Um, and but I'm sure it was yeah. a placebo effect. Yes, mm. quite. Yes. Mm. I still believe scientific medicine offers more effective and more honest treatment. But I accept Nick Humphrey's point that alternative medicine is peculiarly well positioned to dish out placebos. In the 24-7 globalised rat race of the 21st century, people are yearning for time out. Visiting an alternative healer provides an hour for unwinding and contemplation. And if you're lucky, exposure to piped whale music. Much of alternative medicine is about cosseting, about making the patient feel pampered, feel as though they're the center of attention. Okay, so comfort's the name of the game here, so get as comfortable as you can. So literally all I want you to do is just to relax your head, let it go. So the first thing I have to do is very gently cup and hold here. Now you're gonna feel like I'm not doing anything, but it's a very gentle movement. While in our hard-pressed National Health Service, the patient-doctor encounter lasts on average just eight minutes. See the rotation on your left? Yes. Look at the rotation on your right. It's restricted. So this is called an activate. An alternative healer usually gives you an hour. OK. Yeah. In return for a healthy fee, of course. The Hale Clinic near London's Harley Street offers a huge array of healing arts, ancient and modern. Many may make you think you feel better without having real effect in themselves. In other words, they're placebos. If I were wanting to exploit the placebo effect, yes. then I would do exactly what you're doing. I would have uh, a large number of different things which mm -hmm look impressive, sound good, mm. use long words, talk about quantum theory, mm. lights flashing. Mm. Um, and it, the whole point mm. is to impress the patient. The whole point is to make the patient feel that something is, is being done. But, but something is being done. I mean, I, I, uh, I would disagree with you. That I, th I think something is being done. And why are we so good at placebo and the orthodox medicine is oh, not? Oh, well, they're, they're pretty good at it too. And, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I find when I, when I go to my doctor and, yes. and, and he just talks to me, mm. I seem to be miraculously cured mm. uh, as a as a Well, that's very, very important. It is very but important. But maybe he's, a, he's giving you some healing energy, you don't know. Well, he wouldn't call it that. Yes, I, mean, I he know would... he wouldn't call it that, but yes. it could be. It's very, very important to talk, to find out, to take a proper case history. But I don't think it's the only reason. I think complementary medicine has effect over and above that, yeah. in my opinion. Yes. Um, do you ever do, do clinical trials on, on your, your methods or do, do people come in and, and do, do them for you? We've done one study uh, at Hammersmith Hospital on stroke patients um, that was funded uh, quite a few years ago. And uh, what treatment were you giving them? We were giving um, an Ayurvedic treatment called Mama Massage. And yes. uh, this, it was only a pilot study and it showed an improvement in a certain number of patients. So what, what was the control in that case? It, there wasn't a control, it was just an outcome. It was just, it was just a pilot study. Right. So that's not really a, no, pro no. a proper trial. Do you think there's a bit of a double standard? Doctors have to spend six years qualifying mm -hmm. and so on. Isn't it just a bit too easy to set yourself up in practice um, without qualifications and without... Um... Which ones were you thinking of? Well, um, what about the Ayurvedic one, for example? Well, there's a four-year degree course here. What, what do they person. learn? What do they learn? They learn the principles of Ayurveda. They will learn anatomy and physiology. I mean, it's one of the oldest systems of medicine in the world, Ayurveda. It's old, yes. It doesn't make it good, though, does it? No, but it, it shows it has a lot of experience. The idea that ancient equals years of accumulated wisdom is a fallacy. It's a teasing irony that the moneyed classes in the rich West are indulging superseded Hindu healing magic when, back in India, People are voting with their feet and opting for modern vaccines and antibiotics. Resuscitating Ayurveda today is rather like bringing back bleeding with leeches. In medicine, ancient also means developed before we understood the causes of disease, before germ theory. 
It was based on ignorance then, and age makes it no truer. We misguidedly look back to a golden age that never was. Ours is the golden age of safe, tested medicine, effective beyond placebo, in which we've cut infant mortality and conquered diseases, then forgotten they existed. Let's hear it for Western scientific medicine. In the 20th and 21st centuries, we've all but eliminated terrible diseases like polio, completely eradicated smallpox by a worldwide program of vaccination, Antibiotics, well, I wouldn't be here but for antibiotics, and I guess there's a good chance that you wouldn't be either. Blood transfusions, magnificent surgery, all these things are given to us by scientific principles, scientifically trained doctors, all the methods are properly tested and retested. None of that could be said for so-called alternative medicine. The indulgence of superstitious alternative remedies implicitly casts doubt on scientific advance and undermines confidence in real medical progress. Yet, as we've seen, the attack on medicine is just one small part of the creeping rise of irrational superstition. In Ayurveda or clairvoyance, homeopathy or astrology, we're confronted by those who deny evidence of the real world and instead bend reality around a dogmatic belief system handed down by tradition. Skeptical, rational inquiry is always the best approach. We don't have to follow the herd and buy into trendy, untested health fads. We don't have to be swayed this way and that by media-driven health scares. Instead, we can think independently and be truly open-minded. That means asking questions, being open to real corroborated evidence. Reason has liberated us from superstition and given us centuries of progress. We abandon it at our peril. <laughs>